All right, the first half tonight we're going to talk about really quickly the European Middle Ages, which is another one of these gigantic topics that has thousands and thousands of books written on it. Um, but again, we're going to stick to the highlights. We're going to cover many, many years very, very quickly. Uh, so it's become normal for this kind of class. Uh, so first we'll talk about reasons that there is a kind of political chaos in Europe in what the Europeans eventually call the Middle Ages. And then uh, some kind of case studies of these chaotic problems, uh, the Crusades, and then the Hundred Years' War uh, that occurs between France and England that goes on for a hundred years. Um, but the general cause of the chaos in Europe is basically the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 400s, at least by the 400s, the Roman Empire, especially in, in Western Europe, is basically gone. It's a memory. Uh, and that's when a lot of those German groups moved in, even all the way down to Italy, and started fighting each other over land. Uh, the Roman authority basically disappeared, and a lot of the Roman soldiers moved to the eastern part of the empire, down here on this map called the Byzantine Empire. So that's the leftover of Rome, and the, west, the old western half of the Roman Empire is just gone. So you have all these kind of warlords and different social groups moving around and fighting each other uh, for land and power. And it goes on for a long, long time. There's actually a kind of middle phase of all this when uh, one group calling themselves the Franks start in uh, basically what is kind of northeastern France uh, today. And they gradually expanded their empire and kept on conquering and conquering and it took over a big chunk, uh, these three different kind of color areas, like this, this light blue in the west, this greenish in the middle, and this purple and kind of yellowish in the east. Uh, this is all unified under a Frankish empire uh, that eventually became known as the Carolingian family. And uh, they last going into about the 800s. So they're like an intermediary phase. The Carolingian kings often talk about themselves as the new Roman emperors and rebuilding the Roman Empire and whatnot, but uh, they didn't do it nearly as well as the Romans did. Um, their big problem is that Vikings start to invade from the north, and they attack all these different cities throughout the Frankish kingdoms and the Frankish, the Carolingian kings, who can't figure out how to stop it. And so that destabilizes and eventually collapses the Frankish Empire. So that's something that we kind of skip past just that fast, even though it's a process that took hundreds of years. Um, so in the Frankish kind of kingdom, the Carolingians basically disappear, uh, basically because they become unimportant. The Vikings are attacking everywhere, and uh, the Carolingians can't figure out how to stop it. So if you're a person living in one of those towns or villages or something, uh, you don't really care who the Frankish king, who the Carolingian king is anymore. They're, they're irrelevant. They don't matter. They can't stop it. So in this instance, uh, people started looking for protection to more local leaders. And these often become known as counts because they take over small little pieces, local pieces of the empire called uh, counties. And a lot of these counts have enough land and wealth, they build a castle, basically a fort, and they build a wall sometimes around the town, and if the area is being attacked, all the people from the farms and all the countryside around, they all run behind the walls and uh, hope to survive, basically. So these local counts basically replace the Carolingians, the emperors, as a source of protection against attack. So this would be like, I don't know, the Canadians start attacking the United States and all its big cities suddenly. And the President of the United States can't figure out how to stop it. But your local mayor can. Your local mayor has some police and starts you know, building some walls and stuff. And so that's who you go to for protection. Eventually to the point that there's still a president somewhere in the capital city, but people can't even remember his name. That's how meaningless the president becomes. Does that make sense? So it's uh, fragmented down to just local 
rule whoever has enough uh, soldiers to protect the villagers. That's who the that's who they respect. That's who they follow. Does that make sense? All right. Um, and basically, this goes on in Europe for hundreds of years. Uh, you won't get the new kind of uh, national monarchies like France and Germany and uh, England. They don't really exist at this point. There's just kind of open land out there. There's no nationalities or anything. There's different kind of language groups and cultural groups and stuff like that. Uh, but there is no government anymore, really. It doesn't exist. And you won't get a reemergence of monarchies that try to govern a place that's like becoming France or becoming England. Um, you won't get that for hundreds of years. And that's why it's so chaotic, because really no one's in control. There is no law. It doesn't exist. The rules that you follow are the ones that the, the leader of the town sets. So you have kind of kings of these very small territories. And uh, they are the rule. And uh, people are generally so afraid of being attacked and killed or starving to death that they spend most of their day uh, out on their farm trying to grow enough food to eat and uh, defending their families that they don't have time to learn to read and write. Does that make sense? So uh, this becomes known as the European Dark Ages because literacy just collapses, it's gone. And schools don't really exist anymore. Even the counts, the most powerful people in their area, uh, often couldn't even read and write their own name. So even the wealthy and powerful, it's generally not something they're very interested in. Does that make sense? All right. So you get another one of these kind of black holes in history where it's very hard for historians to figure out what these people believed, what, what they worried about on a daily basis because they're not writing letters, they're not writing newspaper articles or diary entries or anything like that. And uh, not just the counts in the kind of large counties, say like San Bernardino County would have one count. Um, if that count is too far away because you know people didn't have cars back then and uh, you know, people can walk maybe 10 to 12 miles in a day or something, but that's dangerous because you could be murdered on the side of the road. Uh, people don't really travel that much, so very often it's not just the count of the overall county that has power in that whole county, it gets subdivided down to the very, very local level, literally towns and villages. So you might theoretically live under the count of San Bernardino, but the real authority in your neighborhood is the mayor of Fontana, or the landowner of Fontana. Does that make sense? And if that person has enough money, they'll build a castle. So power and authority basically collapses to the point where anyone who has enough money to build a castle and hire a bunch of soldiers, uh, they are the power of the area. So you get uh, this term that's generally used in Europe, uh, they call them castellans, and they're just castle owners. And uh, they force through what they want in their local territory, and they push the villagers and the, the farmers and whatnot around. Uh, does that make sense? Um, now, Get into that a little bit later, but questions about anything so far? No. Oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Uh, these castellans, these castle owners, uh, they can't just you know build a castle with some walls and whatnot and expect to win battles. They need soldiers. So they often make uh, deals with. Uh, local soldiers, people, guys who have been militarily trained, they own weapons, they know how to use them, they, they practice how to use them. Uh, they become known as knights. Um, and uh, the knights are basically local mercenaries who work for the castle owner and in exchange for food and a place to sleep and protection and maybe a little bit of money. 
and uh, the Castellans use their knights to go out and force their control over as big of an area as they can really get a hold of. Um, so a lot of these knights are uh, not very reliable people. I mean, mercenaries usually aren't. When you're fighting for a paycheck, uh, there's a big problem with that if you're the if you're the castle owner. What would motivate a knight to uh, murder you in your sleep? Yeah, a better offer from another castle owner. Basically, when you're fighting for money, whoever offers the most money is your boss. So these castle owners are always afraid of their their own knights, and they're afraid of the knights. They get a better deal at turning against them, and maybe killing them and the whole family in, the, in their sleep. Uh, so a lot of these knights and these castle owners are pretty vicious against each other. Uh, they're not really the kind of Disneyland version of knights that you see where they're you know, like honorable and trustworthy and whatnot. Maybe some of them were. Um, but these are usually uh, pretty brutal cutthroat types of guys. Does that make sense? And that's probably why you get so many legends emerging and myths about the. There was this one group of knights way out there in England, and they were like really honorable and did everything that their their king was telling them to do, and they have like a code of ethics and all kinds of stuff. Probably wishful thinking more than anything. Uh, but if the knights, uh, if they felt they're not being paid enough, they might try to take out their castle owner. That the castle is he's protected very often though, so he's tough to kill. Uh, so where else might the knights go to make more money? What's another opportunity for them? You see, average farmers living in the area. They don't have weapons, they don't know how to use them. They're basically defenseless. So a lot of these knights attack the peasants living under their own count and basically extort them for food or you know whatever valuables they can get. So uh, the farmers are theoretically protected, but uh, these these knights would be extremely vicious, and so it's a crime, murder, theft uh, is basically a European wide problem for hundreds of years. So these farmers are literally afraid every single day and night that they could be attacked at any moment and killed because there's no law, there's like no government basically. It's just the the will of whoever is in control of your area. And they're not elected, it's just uh, the wealthy have the most power because they can pay the most soldiers and they take over and that's it. Um, well, another thing about this image, uh, this is called the Knight's Communion. Basically when a castle owner would uh, make a contract or agree to hire a knight, uh, would ask the knight to kind of swear an oath of loyalty, uh, sometimes even on a Bible. Um, so swearing before God that he's actually going to serve this guy and you know, not assassinate him. Uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, once the castle owner gets old and dies, his heir, uh, usually a child, um, takes his position and therefore kind of inherits all the contracts, all the deals with all the knights. Does that make sense? So the children of the castle owner will be trained very often from birth on how to run their business how to run their land holdings and their dealings and whatnot. And uh, the children of the knights would often be trained to be future knights. So these deals were inherited down through sometimes many generations to the point that uh, these same families kind of live in the same area and they're kind of intertwined with each other sometimes for hundreds of years. So castle owners were so afraid of their own knights they tried to form that kind of bond, that kind of contract. Um, and this leads into the larger discussion of what is known as feudalism. Uh, feudalism is the big kind of ism, the big term, uh, the big word for this kind of contractual economic and social system. It's a hierarchy. And we'll kind of fill in the gaps in the hierarchy as we go. Uh, but We've already started talking about these counts, so, and feudalism is, it's a word that's used in different ways across Europe, but we're just gonna stick to the kind of general definition just to make it easy. Um, your people living in different parts of Europe in different times called this system different things. 
and uh, called these counts and lords and whatnot different words, but we'll just stick with some basic ones just to get through it. Um, so we've talked about, say, the count of San Bernardino County, the big county. Um, that count's problem is that the county is too big for him to actually run. Too much land, too many peasants, too many controversies. Um, it's just too big of a job. So the, the count is kind of like an emperor of this smaller area. Uh, basically divides the whole county up into smaller pieces. And those could become towns or duchies or manors or they had all kinds of different names. But the count divides up his whole holding into these smaller pieces and gives one of those pieces out to a local person called a lord. So there would be many, many lords in San Bernardino County. There would be a lord of Fontana, there would be like a lord of Ontario, a uh, lord of Lake Elsinore, a lord of Temecula, and on and on and on. Does that make sense? And basically the lord likes this deal because the count basically tells the lord, this is my land, but you get to run it. And you get to keep a bunch of the money that uh, the land produces. The peasants are out there growing all the food. We'll sell the food. You keep a bunch of the money, and I'll keep a bunch of the money. And the lord likes that because that makes the lord rich. Does that make sense? And all the lords in the county agree with the count as part of the deal that if the count has to go to war against like the count of LA County or the count of Riverside County, that in that instance, all the lords come together and build up the count's army to go to war. Does that make sense? So in a kind of county-wide emergency, all the lords bring all their knights together and form like this county's army to grow to war whenever it's necessary. And so the count has like this power to call all of his, uh, his followers to him. Does that make sense? All right. So it's like, I'll promise to work for you in case of emergency, as long as you keep me on the land and basically allow me to keep getting rich off the land. And in theory, the count is supposed to protect all the lords from outside attack. All right. The problem, though, is that these lords get so rich, they start building their own castles, and they start hiring their own knights. And at that point, you get a big problem. Uh, land is the source of wealth in the ancient world. We've said that many times already. Whoever has the most land has the most money. So a lord that has a lot of land, um, might also have a neighbor, neighboring lord that has a lot of land. And sometimes they'll fight each other, trying to take each other out and gobble up each other's property. Does that make sense? So the lord of Fontana might not like the lord of Rialto very much and might try to attack him and conquer Rialto. But if the lord of Fontana conquers Rialto and now combines both, uh, you know, what does the the Lord of Ontario think of that. Doesn't like it, why not? I mean, next you'll be next. Yeah. The neighbor is now so much wealthier and stronger, he might attack Ontario next. So what does Ontario do? Get prepared. Yeah. How do you prepare for it? Hire a castle. Oh, yeah. Build a castle, hire more soldiers, but you might if you're Ontario, you might attack like Cucamonga or Upland or something to get more land on that side. Does that make sense? To build up more money to defend yourself against the other guy in Fontana. You see how this kind of like has a domino effect and just spreads violence everywhere? The lords are always paranoid of each other. They're always fighting each other. And the Count's problem is that he can't stop it. He's supposed to have authority over them all, but once they get to a point of having enough wealth and strength for themselves, they don't have to fear the count anymore. It's just constant, basically, civil war. It goes on for decades and decades and decades and decades. And there's no end in sight for a long, long time. And these wars are ongoing, and, and you throw the peasant farmers into the problem. Uh, they can't defend themselves. So again, the, the lords and the counts are always attacking each other. 
and it never seems to end. So this violence is just out of control. There's no one to stop it. Remember, there's, there's no countries anymore. They don't really exist, so there's no laws. So it's just chaos. Um, that's why you get so many castles built in uh, some areas of Europe. They're just kind of everywhere, even getting really close to each other's territory. Of course, the counts and the lords each hired their own knights. Um, and another problem emerges when you have this kind of territory. Uh, what happens if a lord or a count has uh, like five or six sons? What happens when the count dies? Stuff. Yeah, usually you would divide up all the lands amongst you like five children, right? Give them each a piece. But what happens if they have five kids each? When they die, their land gets divided up into five pieces, so it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And you have nephews and cousins attacking each other, constantly trying to get each other's land. So the European solution to that was what they call primogeniture, which uh, if you just focus on the first part of it, Primo. What yeah, does that mean? Prime, like the first. The first. So yep. the, this means that eldest son inherits the whole thing. And that was their solution, to try to keep all the territory under one ownership so it didn't get kind of subdivided over and over again to avoid that problem. But that creates another problem. Uh, if you are the children of a lord or a count or some landowner of some name, um, you are trained to be a knight. You're trained to be in your father's army. Now, the Lord doesn't send his kids out to be normal farmers. And when your father dies, and your oldest brother inherits everything, uh, the younger sons run into a big problem. Um, Maybe their older brother is nice and lets him stay in the family, uh, family lands, the family estate. But most older brothers aren't that nice, right? So a lot of these older brothers are afraid of being killed by their younger brothers, so they kick them all out when the father dies. I've taken over. Every, all you guys have to leave. And if they don't want to leave, sometimes he has them killed. So he doesn't get killed. So there's civil war within families over this land inheritance. I mean, that's how important land is in the ancient world. So a lot of these younger sons, they're kicked out of the family inheritance, but they have weapons and they know how to use them. So a lot of times they become mercenaries. They desperately look for a job somewhere so they can live, so they can eat. So a lot of them actually go and work for other lords just as average knights to avoid starvation. And if they can't find a job as a knight, a lot of them wander the countryside, go from place to place, desperately looking for a position. And uh, if they can't find one, a lot of them turn to uh, crime. They just start robbing and stealing, killing people to get enough food to eat. And eventually, when you get into history too, a lot of these younger sons start trying to travel to the Americas, the New World, where there's a Supposedly, all this open land that you can just you know land there on the boat and stake your claim, and suddenly you own land again. Does that make sense? What the hell with the native people? Yeah, well, they didn't consider them human very often, uh, and that was uh, something that a lot of uh, you know they write pamphlets and whatnot to advertise the new land in the Americas. They don't usually put that part in the advertisement. <laughs> it's just like a. Uh, you ever see previews for movies? They always show you the best part of the movie, right? I just watched a movie over the weekend that looked really good according to the preview and ended up not being that good. So, yeah. Uh, but that's another part of history, too. A lot of these younger sons from wealthy families, um, if they can get enough money together, they go to the Americas and try to rebuild their, their wealth. It's like an it's a economic opportunity. It's, a, it's an investment. Um, a lot of them take very big risk because there's nothing back in Europe for them to go back to. Okay, uh, then you throw the people at the lower or the lowest level 
uh, of this system in feudalism. They're generally known as the serfs. They're peasant farmers. Um, they're you know 90 some odd percent of the workforce in Europe, uh, the people in Europe. Uh, so they are the, the average farmer who goes out to the fields and uh, works with the crops and tries to grow fruit it basically every day. Um, they usually work for their local lord. So if you were born into a family in Fontana, you worked for the lord of Fontana until your father dies. And then you inherit his position as a peasant farmer. So the Lord would say, break up all of Fontana into very small little plots, usually four or five acres maybe. And each of those very small plots is handed out to a serf family, headed by the, the husband or the father, whoever the eldest male is in the house. And they make promises, they take oaths of lifetime allegiance to that Lord. So a lot of these families, they don't move around very much. And the basic deal is the Lord says, I'll give you this little plot of land. Do you farm it? You and your family can keep a bunch of the food to eat so you can live. And the rest you give to me and I'll sell it at market for money. And that money goes to the Lord in the count. And uh, the serfs, their end of the deal is they get food and they get protection from the Lord. So if uh, you and your neighboring farmers like, get into a fist fight or something, uh, you go to the Lord, and the Lord is kind of like the judge of the whole case. Does that make sense? All right. So the serfs are the overwhelming amount of um, population in Europe in the so-called Middle Ages, uh, and the overwhelming amount of the workforce. And it's very, very, very difficult for serfs to get out of that level and to rise up to be a lord because they're very often not getting paid in money. They don't have money. They're paid in food. There's a couple kind of paintings of them from the medieval era. Um, these are very optimistic, happy kind of versions of what peasant life looked like in Europe. Um, so they're out there working the fields, and you see the big castle or big house or something like that in the background. And uh, different families work different areas of the land. And this is basically what they did all the time. Um, this group is almost entirely uneducated uh, because books in Europe were literally worth their weight in gold because it, they, they didn't have mass printing yet, so they were making books by hand, by handwriting everything out. So books were extremely expensive, way more than almost any peasant family could afford. So they wouldn't even have reading material around for them to learn to read, uh, even in what free time they had. And uh, they maybe owned two or three sets of clothes, and they worked out in the mud in the rain. So uh, these were... Uh, you know, pretty dirty circumstances, and uh, there's a lot of disease that would become epidemic. And there were plagues in Europe. Uh, it was not the healthiest time. Uh, but again, these are very optimistic versions of it because these workers are look very clean. Um, they don't look very happy. You know, look at them <laughs> holding their heads down. But uh, they definitely didn't have as much as we have to worry about today, right? They didn't have to worry about carburetors and credit scores and uh, semester courses and all that kind of stuff. They just worried about the seasons and trying to survive. And hoping not to start death. So one of my instructors in college said, Oh, it must have been must not have been that bad to be a peasant farmer back then because you, know, you work hard in the summertime, but the wintertime comes around, there's no food growing really. Got a lot of time off. And hopefully you have enough uh, Wood for your fireplace so you don't freeze to death. <laughs> but that was his interpretation. I disagree. Um, and if the area came under attack, a lot of them would kind of try to get to the castle and get behind the walls uh, to survive the, the invasion. Robots maintain the animals. What, how do they maintain the animals? Yeah. Uh, a lot of animals are allowed to eat certain of the crops, and that's how they survive. But they generally don't have a lot of animals, especially compared to today. 
Um, in Europe, meat was an expensive item for food. So that's often why you see, like in movies and whatnot, like the king is sitting at his table and he's got some meat, but uh, a lot of the average kind of farmers out there didn't eat much meat. They mostly ate uh, the crops that grew. So yeah, and they didn't have access to a whole lot of clean water. It's whatever they could really gather from the rain or this local stream or river or something like that. Yeah. But they didn't apparently have much air pollution, so that's a plus. They did have to worry about poison water supplies because they often, uh, in the springtime, they'd often like clean out their houses or clean out the town behind the walls and they'd throw a lot of that human waste uh, into the river, um, which is not a good idea if that's your water supply. It'd be like drinking out of the toilet, basically. Not a good idea, in case you've ever thought of trying that. I'd advise against it. All right. Um, at the theoretical top of this, after hundreds of years, when you start getting the kind of formation of France and England and uh, eventually Spain um, and much, much later Germany, uh, the theoretical top of this system is the king. Uh, especially in England, the king of England says, and tries to get away with this, that all the land in England is, is his personal property. And his theory is, I own this whole island, but I can't govern it all, so I split it up into sections, these counties, and I give them out to the counts, who split up the county into smaller pieces and give it out to the lords, who split it up into smaller pieces and give them out to the serfs. Does that make sense? But this count and lord and serf system had been around for a while, so these new kind of national monarchies, like the French king or the English king or whoever, they just try to kind of plant themselves on top. And a lot of times it doesn't really work out very well because you have to convince the counts to accept this, and a lot of them don't want to because they're afraid of giving up their power, even in theory, to someone else. So uh, this leads to a lot of like frequent assassinations of kings and civil wars where a group of council get together and say, we don't like this king who um, is claiming to have control over us, and they start a revolt. Does that make sense? There's a lot of famous instances of that. So a lot of times these kings, they say they have power, but like with the early kings of France, they're basically just the counts of Paris, the capital city. So they have authority uh, in Paris itself, but like nowhere outside of Paris do really most of the rest of the counts of France care about the king or who he is or what he says. Does that make sense? And... Uh, it's a, a long, long process for the kings of France to try to convince the counts to accept their authority and consolidate power and, and make themselves into a powerful monarchy. Uh, so even in these like newly merging national governments like England or France, there really isn't much national law. There's no national authority. It's really whoever has power on the local area. And power is the result of wealth, money. And wealth depends on whoever has the most territory. So again, land is the source of power because that's what makes you money. You use that money to build castles, raise walls, hire knights and build armies. And uh, all the counts and lords know this about each other and that's why they're always attacking each other. There's no higher authority, there's no national government, there's no king to stop it. It just goes on and on and on for centuries. To the point that the average people living out there in society, they, their number one focus is just survival. And that's why we call it, again, the Dark Ages, because they're not reading or writing or anything like that for the most part. And we don't have like internal testimonies or documents. Uh, the best we have are these kind of legends. And even when monarchs start to rise, say around the 11 or 1200s, uh, they don't have enough power over the council to stop it. They'll 
issue a statement saying you need to stop fighting each other. But if you don't have an army to enforce it, who really cares what the king says? Does that make sense? And you still get that problem in the world today. Uh, you know, United Nations often sends a statement to certain countries, uh, you need to stop fighting. But if they have armies and you really don't, then they don't really care what you think. That's the reality of power. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So uh, for a long time, a lot of monarchs, these rising national monarchs, they're desperately trying to figure out some way of gaining enough control to stop all this violence and to kind of rise in their own authority. And even church leaders get involved in this, desperately trying to think of possibilities, ways, or systems they could build uh, to convince these knights and lords and counts and whoever else to stop attacking each other. And the church is actually more successful than the monarchs. Um, the church, uh, the Christian church, basically think of today as the post-church uh, Catholicism, um, the Pope started announcing policies where like, you can't attack someone that's in a church, like on the physical grounds of the church. So if you are an average peasant or even a knight just kind of walking down the street, or walking down the road, probably didn't have streets, um, and you see a group of your enemies running after you, your number one goal usually is to find out where the nearest church is and get in that building, because murder inside the building is illegal. It's said to be basically a sin against God. And anyone who does it, anyone who kills someone else in a church is like automatically going to hell. Does that make sense? So you still get these kind of leftover kind of cultural stories and whatnot about you know, someone went into a church and uh, their enemies basically encamped outside and waited for them to come out so they could kill them. And that person stayed in there for months and months and months or something because he knew if he took a step outside, he was instant death. Does that make sense? Uh, another thing that the church leaders tried to do was... Uh, they created these holy days in the calendar, days of like religious observance, um, that they said it's illegal to cause any violence on. And what's the biggest holiday in Christianity? Christmas. Christmas is number two. There's, there's a big one. Or Easter. Yep, Easter Sunday. So on those days, you're not allowed to attack each other and uh, still get into heaven when you die. And they found that one was the most successful. So what do you think is a natural result? What, what did they do when they realized that worked? Made more. They made more holidays. So they start filling up the calendar with all these holidays to try to kind of clamp down on the violence as much as they possibly can. And that was one of the, the few systems that actually worked. Uh, so questions about any of these ideas? This is more like the kings start living more towards church? Well, a lot of the kings, especially because a lot of these counts and lords have, you know, they've taken oaths of office, basically, with church leaders. They realize that becoming friends with the church leaders is a good way to try to control the counts. So a lot of kings themselves, uh, even if they're not very religious themselves, they view it as like a, a political opportunity to gain a larger amount of control. So a lot of kings become very close to church leaders and uh, try to get their own family members brought into the church, uh, usually uh, like younger sons in the monarchy. So there's that kind of allegiance between the monarchy and the church. And you, know, you have hundreds of monarchies out there in Europe, so some of them are better at it than others. Some of them are more effective at it. And eventually by... a uh, 1400s, 1300s, where uh, one family from it, from Italy, the Medici, they get some of their own family appointed to be popes, which is pretty extraordinary. And some guys that had a pretty licentious reputation <laughs> got to be popes uh, based on those political and family and wealth connections. Pope Alexander. Yep. So, yep. Uh, other questions? Nope. Moving on. The biggest uh, thing that you'll see is a result of the, the kind of cooperation between uh, church leaders and uh, counts and monarchies and whatnot come to be known as the Crusades. 
And uh, many historians argue that this is an attempt by church leaders to get all these violent guys, all these counts and lords and knights, out of Europe and send them somewhere else to do their damage to some other place. So some argue that the Pope and his advisors proposed this crusade to get all these violent guys and send them somewhere else so that the violence in Europe would be solved. And the Pope who proposes this idea is named Urban II, and he gives this famous sermon in France in uh, 1095. Oops. Perfect middle ground. All right. Um, Where he basically says that uh, God is giving European Christian leaders a mission to go reconquer what he calls the Holy Lands, basically the Eastern Mediterranean around Jerusalem, you know, kind of birthplace of Christianity, uh, to go and conquer that from the Muslim Empire that has control of it at that point. Or one of these Muslim empires. And the Pope said that God wants us to do this. God is going to help us do this. And one of the keys appears to have been if you're a knight and you go out and help with this and you go to the battlefield and you kill the enemy, God forgives you in advance. You won't be punished for causing violence, for for killing, because you're doing God's work. Does that make sense? So this sermon becomes so famous that it immediately gets printed and uh, the Pope basically goes on tour all around Europe uh, for several weeks, uh, giving the same sermon over and over again. And it was so popular in Europe, it starts like a whole movement toward what becomes known as the Crusades that lasts beyond the Pope's lifetime, uh, that really goes on for hundreds of years, where the Europeans will talk about doing this crusade. And even if that crusade fails, couple decades later the idea will come back around so there's a whole kind of like popular movement to do this and there's a, a popular faith that it's going to work even when sometimes it didn't work does that make sense all right so this will go on for a long 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 time um, and Textbooks will, depending on which textbook you read, there's like eight or nine crusades. Uh, some books will call a crusade like an official crusade that other books don't recognize as a real official crusade. So it's kind of confusing. So it really depends on which historian you're talking to or which book you're reading or which documentary you're watching. Um, there's actually an early crusade, like Crusade Zero, basically, where this idea of crusading was so popular that a lot of peasants left their farms and started traveling, uh, especially in Germany, started traveling eastward to go do this themselves, even though they don't really have many weapons and they're not professional soldiers. So this became known as the Peasants' Crusade. It's not led by kings, it's led by kind of average people. And they believe that uh, basically when they got uh, down close to what is today Turkey, um, they would encounter a a professional army. And if you're an average farmer, how are you going to win? If you've never trained on the battlefield, you've never used weapons before, how are you going to win against a professional army that's done this before? Well, you're likely not, but what did they believe? That God was with them. That God was going to intervene and destroy the enemy or do something to help them win because they're doing what God wants them to do. So they actually walked toward the enemy army and uh, the Muslim army just wipes them out. Just, just, just annihilates them, basically. Um... Uh, so right there, immediately, the theory didn't work, or the belief didn't work. 
But that doesn't stop the, the major political leaders of Europe. They organize a first crusade. Uh, this is done by a lot of counts and lords, so there's money behind it, there's professional soldiers behind it. So the first official crusade finally gets all the way down through modern day Turkey and down to Jerusalem and conquers Jerusalem uh, in 1099 and uh, reportedly massacres virtually every Muslim in the city and uh, takes control of the entire eastern Mediterranean and uh, starts setting up new governments for that area to make sure that Europeans have access to it and they're going to control the, the coastline for the long term. So they set up these so-called client states all along the coast. Um, one of their major problems though is that a lot of these European landowners, these counts, they don't trust each other during the whole thing and even when they set up these coastline governments a lot of the counts start attacking each other and trying to get each other's land and whatnot. So they basically take the same problem they had in Europe and they just copy it. <laughs> they copy and paste it on the Mediterranean. So about 50 years later um, there's a Muslim counterattack starting in the northern area and eventually moves further south and takes Jerusalem back from the Europeans. And the Europeans don't like that, so they agree to start a second crusade. And that one goes off largely again from France and Germany, or what's emerging as France and Germany. Um, they eventually get to Constantinople, they reconquer the place. In 1185, somewhere around there. I have to look up that here. Um, in this instance, it appears that the reason that uh, the Second Crusade won was because the Muslim occupiers of the area were even more divided amongst themselves. So the Europeans attacked a divided enemy. Until one leader named Saladin uh, a lot of textbooks say he organizes the Muslim resistance, which uh, is actually extremely brutal and uh, destroys a lot of uh, individual Muslim political groups in order to kind of bring them all together. And uh, he launches, a, or they launch a counterattack against Jerusalem and take it back. So this is going back and forth, back and forth, over about the hundred years after the original uh, sermon by Urban II. Does that make sense? So, questions about that? The first two crusades go back and forth, back and forth, uh, but in the end, the Muslims are back in control of the place, so uh, the Europeans organize a third crusade, uh, which is a deal between the English king, Richard I, uh, the French king, and there's a German king named Frederick, and they agree to like, get as many soldiers together, each of the three of them, and join forces and launch a third crusade. Uh, this one runs into immediate problems. Number one, the German king Frederick uh, drowns when trying to cross a river. His boat overturned and he died. So that didn't help. Um, the French king actually didn't really leave France. Uh, because when the English king left with his army, the French king saw that as an opportunity to try to conquer land in the area. So the French and the English don't really trust each other very much. So in the end, uh, the English king, Richard I, is the only one of the three that actually gets his soldiers down into modern day Turkey, um, but they are stopped, they are defeated. So they never even get to Jerusalem. So the Third Crusade fails. And uh, that's when you get the Robin Hood story in England where the, the real king has uh, gone off to do this glorious thing and left his younger brother in charge. And the younger brother is kind of running a mess of the place. So, again, another legend that, like many others we've talked about, has its basis in historical events. 
but a lot of it appears to have been a story. Uh, there's a lot of other crusades. Uh, they never get to Jerusalem again. The rest of the crusades fail, so the Muslims stay in control of the place for uh, a long, long, long time, uh, way far into history, too. Um, one of my favorites is the so-called Children's Crusade, which is, guess what? Kids. Crusade of Children. Um, this one starts in about 1212, where a French kid named Stephen is just a average, he and his family are just average farmers or peasants. And he reports having a vision when he's out in, the, out in the field during the day. He says that Jesus came walking up to him and told him to, leave, to lead a group of children, European children, and walk to Jerusalem. Uh, and that God would intervene and help them and give them the Holy Lands, basically, because they're the, the purest of the pure. Does that make sense? And uh, he says that Jesus told them that uh, if he took this message to the King of France, that the King of France would help. And uh, so Stephen you know, told his parents, and the word starts to spread. Um, Eventually, some kind of townspeople bring Stephen to the French king, and Stephen gives the French king this message. And what does the French king do? Kills him. No, he doesn't kill him, but he doesn't get the hell out of here. Uh, he doesn't believe him. Uh, so Stephen then uh, gives another message to the European public, calling on the children of Europe to go with him to Marseille which is a uh, kind of seaside town in southern France. And Stephen says if the good children of Europe will join him there, they're going to walk to the beach, and God will part the sea, and they will walk from France all the way to Jerusalem. That's how they're going to make it there. So a bunch of kids join him one morning, and what do you think happens? They all drown. Well, just go walking in the water. They're waiting for the steam to part. So what happens? Never happens. Doesn't happen. So they're very disheartened. <laughs> they're very disappointed. Um, at that point, apparently some businessmen in the area believe all of this, and they give these kids, uh, I think it was seven ships, seven boats, just gives it to the kids and says, okay, pile on the boats and sail to Jerusalem. No ship captain, no adults. It's all kids, uh, reportedly, uh, I think it's like 14 and under. So they all pile on the boats, and they set sail, and what happens to them? They're never seen again. Exactly. We don't know what happened to them. <laughs> um, we are pretty certain that they never made it to Jerusalem. That's a nice start. Yeah. <laughs> But they sailed away, and uh, there's only really one report of them ever again. Uh, 18 years later, a guy comes into France and claims to have been one of those kids. And so he tells a story, apparently, over and over in bars, um, that uh, they set sail, and they were sailing south, and uh, a storm hit them, and uh, shipwrecked two of the ships, and so they're all killed. Uh, the, the rest of the five continued, but as they got closer down toward Africa, they were taken captive by pirates, and that they were sold into slavery throughout uh, all the, uh, basically, North Africa and the Middle East. And that uh, the guy eventually bought him, thought that this was such a funny story, he eventually released him and told him to go back to Europe and tell him what happened. But we don't know if this is actually true. Like, it could be just some guy that wants to get free drinks in a bunch of different bars, so he has a story to tell. But Children's Crusade didn't work. Uh, and Jerusalem remained controlled uh, by one Muslim kingdom or empire or another for the next many hundred years. Uh, historians have written a lot about the Crusades. The general theory that the historians have put out is that the Crusaders didn't trust each other. 
and that they're always fighting and bickering over land and who gets to own and control what. Um, so they were not a united force going in for an invasion, and that harmed their power to the point that they, in the few times where they actually get control of the place, they can't keep it. And uh, many European historians have also written that uh, this didn't even stop the amount of violence in Europe, so it didn't accomplish either of its goals. Does that make sense? All right. Questions about the Crusades at all? Nope. Moving on. All right. Okay. You don't have to write all this down. Uh, but this explains basically why this other thing called the Hundred Years gets started in the 1300s. Basically, at this point, you have an English king uh, in very increased power. But you have an English monarchy, a family. So there's an Edward the first, and then an Edward the second, and then Edward the third. Um, England and France often go to war with each other. Sometimes when they sign a peace treaty, like the English king will take his son, or one of his sons, and marry him to a French princess. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. To try to make an alliance to, to be friends, the two countries to be friends again. So in this instance, uh, the guy who becomes Edward II marries a French princess, and they have a child who eventually becomes Edward III in England. Does that make sense? The French have their own monarchy. And here's where the problem emerges. They have their own king who has a whole bunch of sons, so they don't really care who the daughter marries because she's not going to inherit anything through primogeniture, right? All right. The problem is that by the time... Uh, let's see. By the time that this guy dies, all his children have died too, all his male sons. So Edward III says, I should be king of France. Does that make sense? Because the only surviving child is the daughter, and that leads to me. So I should be king of England and France at the same time. Does that make sense? The French complain about that because the French say, well, before going to that guy's daughter, he had a younger brother who's not even alive still, but that guy has sons, so this guy should be king of France. Is that clear? All right. So these two are going to fight it out, or at least they're going to start it. Um, and a lot of historians basically argue that Edward III, this is a really weak claim to French land. So they depict him as a kind of guy who's interested in just grabbing up as much land through any justification you can possibly find. Um, and England is actually attacking, or will be attacking, and conquering a lot of land in northern France throughout this hundred year conflict. So all these areas in France, in purple in the northern parts, uh, that's under English occupation, um, sometimes for many years. And uh, a lot of the French counts, and even the French king, they don't like that very much. And uh, their position is we have to you know, build up the French kind of unified armies and attack the English and kick them out of our country. But the English occupy some of those places for so long um, that they have English names even today. In Normandy, the coastline in northern France, Brittany. Um, and the first big battle uh, happened way in northern France at a place called Crecy. That's way up there in 1346. And this appears to be when uh, a kind of English army is wandering around in an area and almost accidentally runs into a bunch of French soldiers and they fight it out. Um, this is a medieval depiction of movement somehow. Um, their artists apparently weren't very good at depicting depth. So, it looks to me more like dance and crazy. But this starts off a conflict that goes on and on and on because really neither side can gain the upper hand over the other. 
Uh, the English, they have a smaller population than France, so they can never get, to get enough soldiers together to fully conquer all of France and control it. That's their problem. It's a logistical problem. The French army, because they have a bigger population, the French can build up a bigger army, but the problem is that they use foot soldiers, literally knights with swords walking around on foot, whereas the English use cavalry, which are uh, soldiers on horses. So the English have fewer soldiers, but they're much more powerful. Does that make sense? But they'll never have enough soldiers to, to conquer the whole place. So it's called the Hundred Years' War because it goes back and forth for so long. It lasts about 100 years, or just under 100 years, like 98 years or something like that. That doesn't sound as good. Um, they don't constantly fight each other for 100 years. and Basically, they'll, they'll fight each other pretty heavily for five or six years, uh, sometimes longer than that, but usually fairly short periods. And then each side basically runs out of money and resources, and so they just kind of stop fighting maybe for five or ten years, and then they'll go back at it when they rebuild their, uh, their resources. Does that make sense? But it just goes on and on and on and on. And uh, the French particularly hate this because it's their land that's being attacked and occupied. Um, and the most famous leader in all this becomes uh, known as Joan of Arc, or in French, Jean d'Arc. Um, she comes from another peasant family, and it's a very similar story where uh, she reports that uh, she's something like 15 years old when this gets started. Uh, she reports that she's out in the farm with her family, and uh, God gave her a message. Uh, Stephen? Hmm? I said another Stephen? No, not another one, but very similar one. Uh, but the message is that uh, basically a plan that she's supposed to take to the king of France about how to win this thing and liberate France, free France from foreign occupation. Um, and uh, eventually she is brought to the king of France and delivers the message and she never claims to be anything except the messenger and she says that over and over again reportedly. And the king of France doesn't believe her. Kind of laughs at her and says this is really amusing, this must be a joke. And in uh, order to prove it, she convinces some uh, French military guys, some army leaders, uh, to bring her into the army and make her one of the leaders of an attack against an English fort um, that was expected to fail. They didn't apparently have enough soldiers to really take the place to conquer it from the English. But with her leading the attack, they actually win, and she gets wounded, she gets hit with an arrow and survives. And uh, a lot of the French soldiers see that as an inspiration. So uh, for about, I think, two years, she joins a lot of different battles. And uh, the French win basically every single one. And so a lot of them really do believe that she has like God's power on her side and that this girl, this teenage girl, is going to lead them to finally overthrow the English and kick them out. Um, the French army that she's helping lead uh, loses one battle and she's taken prisoner. Um, eventually some, some counts that don't like the French king get a hold of her and they offer to basically ransom her to the French king. The French king doesn't have the money so he can't do it. Uh, so instead they sell her to the English and the English put her on trial for uh, basically heresy, being a, like a false prophet, which is a kind of religious crime, and they uh, burn her to death. So she has a very kind of quick history, that only lasted a couple years or so. Um, but a lot of the French soldiers are continually inspired by her example, and uh, I think within 10 years they finally win the Hundred Years' War and and push the English out of France. Uh, so, the Hundred Years' War has an effect that 
kind of reverberates throughout, especially England and France. Um, number one, it taught a lot of the French counts that they have to really unify and, and build a powerful centralized government under a king. So from this point forward, uh, going especially into the 1600s, uh, the French kings will be increasingly powerful and will really hit their peak in the late 1600s under a, a specific French king. But it convinces them to kind of form a powerful central government because you know, being divided amongst themselves, they think it caused this catastrophe. Um, the failure of the English kings to, to accomplish their goals leads to a civil war in England where a few different families basically try to all become kings. Uh, and this just creates a massively destructive war that goes on for 30 years where they're just all killing each other like crazy. It becomes known in England as the War of the Roses. Um, but the French forces and the English forces are so badly damaged by this that it opens an opportunity for a new country, newly unified Spain, to kind of rise up real quick and to become the dominant power, especially in Western Europe. And they mostly do that by uh, starting the kind of Columbus explorations of the New World, and they conquer empires in the Americas, and they steal as much gold as they possibly can. And that's how Spain becomes the most powerful country in the world in the 1500s.